And I think uh, we can get started. My name is Darcy, like I said, I work for Rural Actions Environmental Aid Education Team. We have a few other people that I work with here today that are gonna show you a few different shelters we build in the woods. We're gonna look at some animal shelters. Uh, and we have a pretty small group. So the way this works is right now, most of you are on mute. Um, and if you have a question or you wanna share a story, you can unmute yourself and share, and then you can mute yourself again because it can get really loud if we all stay unmuted. Or if you want to, you can type in the chat and I'll watch the chat and make sure any questions go to the person who is sharing it. Um, so shelter building. We, maybe you were just thinking about a little maybe forts you've built, but if I'm out in the woods and I need to build a shelter and I don't have a tent, what I'm really looking for is a way to stay warm and a way to stay dry. So that is what I think makes a good shelter. But I'm going to send us to Joe, who is out in the Trimble Community Forest right now near an amazing shelter builder's home. Take it away, Joe. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Darcy. All right. So let me flip this around so I can show you this amazing beaver dam right here. Look at that. Amazing how they can build such robust dams. Just kidding. There's the real dam. And I don't know how easy it is to tell, but this is at least as tall as I am. So this is like five, almost six feet tall. I'm actually gonna climb up on here so you can see what's going on. But you'll notice all these sticks have been, uh, have the tooth marks of the beaver. So they've cut down all these and stacked them up. Like, I'll get up here so you can have a better view, but um, it's like probably about the length of a football or a soccer field. So I don't know how many sticks it is, but it's a lot. Okay, look, this one's uh, actually growing. It's a willow tree. It's on here and it's actually sprouting. So it could grow more of the beavers, one of their favorite foods right here on their dam. Okay. I made it. And there is the lodge. So what are you guys seeing that this is made of? Both the lodge and the dam here. So studying beavers is cool for your kid because it's the only time you can say damn and get away with it. So what's this dam made of? Sticks and mud. Bingo. Sticks and mud. How many sticks do you think are in here? A lot. <laughs> Good answer. A lot. A hundred? Yeah. I bet there's like, I bet I'm standing on a hundred at once. There could be 20,000 sticks in this dam. I don't know. So they, they work pretty hard and the beavers are like, they're using their teeth, of course, to cut down trees, but you can see there's scoops of mud right there. Um, they, the beavers actually use their, um, their front feet a lot, almost like, like they'll carry the mud. Um, and place it down. You can see this right here is a toenail mark of the beavers. They have big nails. Um, and so, you know, sometimes they'll build their lodge all the way out in the middle of the pond. But this beaver has probably dug a burrow up under the hillside there and then also covered it with sticks and mud. So they, how did they get in there? I don't see any entrances, do you? They swim and in, in they, they go in the water and go up under it. Exactly, they make like underwater entrances. So they'll swim down into the pond and then up into the lodge. And that's because, you know, this in the winter time could freeze over. So the beavers have to be able to get in and out of the lodge um, even if the water's frozen, but they're 
their actual shelter is high enough that it's above the water so they can um, they can stay reasonably dry and you know those mud walls are so thick that I could go over there and jump up and down on it it wouldn't do anything um, so it's, it's really strong and they also have to leave like a little vent hole somewhere so I haven't seen this ever but I'd love to someday if it's really cold in the winter um, sometimes you can see steam coming out of a little vent hole in the in the beaver lodge and as we were kind of discussing before the call here, sometimes muskrats will also be allowed to um, to share the lodge with beavers. And the muskrats usually bring in some green vegetation, um, you know, kind of like if you're going to a, a potluck or something, the muskrats are bringing a salad. So that maybe is one reason why the beavers allow them to share the shelter with them. So pretty cool. And you know, some of, the beaver's natural predators are be around here basically only coyotes and maybe bobcats. You know, the young beavers might be prey for a bigger bird like a bald eagle. Um, but in other parts of the country, you know, wolves actually eat a lot of beavers. And so it's important for them to have good shelter. But the other interesting thing is, you know, by really changing the landscape, they make the they make their habitat safer for them. So anytime there's danger, if they're out swimming and gathering food, they can dive down um, underwater and escape from predators that way. And they even dig channels so they can travel safely from their feeding spots back to their pond. And then the last thing I want to make sure to mention before we show some other things is that before the beavers were here and made this dam, this landscape out here would have just looked like woods all the way down to a creek. And now you can see there, it's really open. There's not a lot of trees. Probably the only trees that will survive in this pond are the willows and maybe if there's a sycamore out there somewhere. The other trees can't really handle having their roots saturated so much by the water. So they create all these, you know, the trees eventually die and those dead standing trees like that one right there in the middle, um, are a really good habitat for woodpeckers to make their nests in. And then a lot of other birds will reuse those old woodpecker nests like tree swallows, prothonotary warblers, great crested flycatchers. Um, so they're really making some new habitat for a lot of other things. And I don't know if you could hear that, but I just heard a, a bullfrog. So this is, you know, a really nice pond for, for frogs as well. And also um, turtles. Okay, so that's the hot news from the beaver pond. If anybody awesome. has a question, I'm all ears. Thank you, Joe. Does anyone have any beaver questions? The beavers are right there. I could just ask them. So if you wanted to be inspired by a beaver in, in building shelter in some other way, what, what is something that you might try if you're trying to build a shelter inspired by beavers? This is a question to the group at large. Yeah, it's a question to the group at, at large. But yeah. If people are keeping their ideas to themselves, you could share your ideas too, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I want to hear what everybody else is thinking. <laughs> Someone suggested you could make a dam in a creek. Uh, humans do make dams sometimes. For yeah. electricity or to make a place to fish. I think even the shapes of our dams are based on beavers. Like, it's kind of hard to see, but it it's not a straight line, it bows out so that it's kind of circular, which makes it stronger. Someone asked how old beavers live up to. Yeah, I saw that. I have no idea. That's a great question. My guess is no older than 15 years old, but I bet the average beaver lives six years. That's a total guess though. 
But the dams will last a long time because we'll see them for a few years and then sometimes maybe the beavers are gone and the dam falls into disrepair, but then maybe another beaver finds it and fixes it up. So the dams can last a long time. That's right, yeah. And grasses and other things will start growing on there and in the next few years it'll be hard to tell there's even a dam here at all except for the fact that the pond will be here still. <laughs> Someone googled it and says beavers can live 20 to 30 years. Wow, incredible. Okay, so like we said today, we're going to show you a few animal shelters and we're also going to talk about how you can build a shelter to survive in in the woods. And we will take a look at a shelter that Danny built that is inspired a little by the pile of sticks method and also inspired a little by piles of leaves, which is kind of like how squirrels uh, build their nests. And we're looking for in a shelter is paying attention to how it'll keep us dry, how it'll keep us warm. Uh, when you're in a survival situation, sometimes we talk about following the rule of threes. And it's kind of oversimplified, but what the rule of threes means is if you're in an emergency, you can maybe make it three minutes without enough air. So you wanna stop, make sure you're breathing well, you're healthy, you know you're still healthy. If you're in extreme cold or heat, you can maybe make it three hours without enough shelter. And if you don't have water with you, you can maybe make it, depending on how hot it is, about three days without water and about three weeks without food. So if you were lost in the woods, what do you think would be one of the first things that you wanted to do to stay safe? Evan suggested water. Have, um, have food. Some food. Those are definitely important things um, if you're gonna be out there for a while. But if it's really cold or really hot, the first thing you really need is to get uh, warm and dry. So shelters actually, if I knew, thought, oh, I'm just lost today, maybe I only have to make it through one night and maybe I'll find my way out in the morning, shelter would be my first priority because you're gonna get too cold or freeze or sick faster than you are gonna get too thirsty or too hungry because you can make it three days or three weeks without water or food, but not only a few hours if you're freezing. So Danny, I'll put you on spotlight and you can show us the shelter that you built um, yesterday afternoon, right? You can, maybe you can tell us how long, how fast you can get one of these together. Okay, sure. So I am actually at Sells Park. That's where I decided to build my shelter. And if you have been on the paths before, here's where I am at the Rock House and Athens Trail where it splits. And I built my shelter. Hopefully you can see it. it's pretty well camouflaged right over here. So if you want to come check it out, come over to Sells Park and you might be able to find it. So this is called a debris shelter or debris hut shelter. And what is the first thing you guys notice when you see the shelter? What is it made out of? Or what does it look like it's made out of? Leaves. Leaves, yeah. Anything else? Anything else besides the leaves? Branches? Yeah, so that is the that's basically what this whole debris hut is made out of. I made it completely out of branches, twigs, and leaves. And why do you think I would do that? Why would I want to add leaves to the shelter? Leaves to keep rain off of? Okay, yeah, that's a key. What did you say? Sorry. Insulation. Insulation, yeah, really, really important. So when I wanted to make the shelter, I knew that I would want to keep my body nice and warm if it got too cold outside. So that is why I added a bunch of leaves. 
Leaves create a lot of insulation for your shelter. Does anyone know what insulation means? Anyone have an like idea? Of what stuff means? to keep you warm, like the stuff that traps air so that it keeps you warm. Yeah, something that traps air. So insulation in this case is going to be leaves because my leaves are trapping a bunch of little tiny air pockets all throughout this roof structure and along the sides and even on the bottom. So when I lay in there tonight to sleep in it in the rain, I will be able to keep nice and dry because of all those leaves. And I'll be able to keep myself nice and warm because my body is going to be giving off heat and it's gonna, the heat is all gonna get trapped because of these layer of leaves. Just like we wear winter clothes, we wear like a lot of layers. That's creating air spaces between our body and between the clothes. So our clothes are actually what's trapping that body heat in. Our clothes are acting as insulation. So what are some other things that, maybe I can take a pan of the floor. What are some other things that you guys see that I could have used? as insulation, making those air, those trapped air spots. You guys see anything? Bark, okay. Trying to find something, ooh, here's a good thing. What about this? What's on here that would be good insulation? Is that a frog's toupee? Oh, this? <laughs> Moss, yeah. I thought this was an actual plant called frog's toupee. But this moss here would actually provide a lot of insulation. It's nice and fluffy, it's nice and warm, but I feel like I would have to find a lot of moss to cover my structure. So it would probably take me a lot longer to build. How long do you guys think this structure took me to build. It's only about as big on the inside for my body to fit in, and I'm about five feet tall. All right, someone said two hours. An hour. Yeah, it took me a little over an hour and a half, probably closer to two hours to build this. And this is the first structure that I've ever built before. So I definitely didn't think it would take that long. Um, and on my, if I were to build another one, it would probably take me closer to three hours just to get in those little holes to fill all the leaves and stuff in, keep it nice and insulated. Danny, it looks small. Aren't you cramped in there? Well, it actually is kind of small. Yeah, I didn't, let me see. I'm gonna try and crawl in here. I hope the leaves don't all fall on my head. <laughs> so I am barely in here right now. The roof of it is right there. So I made this only big enough for me to be able to sleep in it. I didn't want to make it any bigger or else that would just be extra, extra cold air that would be in my structure. So I'm trying to keep it as warm as possible. And it smells really good. All the leaves smell like maple leaves right now. Do you guys have any questions? You can kind of see the inside structure a little better. <laughs> Friend says it's better than nothing, but it's not a mansion. <laughs> yeah, definitely that's true. not anything luxurious here. The point really is just to be enough to keep you safe and warm. What's on the floor? All right, can you guys see what is on the floor? More leaves. Yep, so Joe and Nate, um, they recommend six inches of leaves on the floor of your structure, on the roof of your structure, and since this is a debris hut, I made it all the way around. So this probably isn't enough leaves, actually. This probably isn't, this is probably only about two inches of leaves. So I, I need to get cracking and add more leaves to my shelter to make it even more insulated. 
Yeah, you can kind of see some sunlight coming through. So if I was building that, I would you crawl inside and look at the sunlight and realize, ah, there's some parts of the roof I need to patch so the rain doesn't get through. And that six inches is after you lay down on it. So when you lay down on your leaf pile, it's going to get smooshed and you're going to need to add more, even more to make it six inches because the ground is cold and the ground will suck heat out of you all night. Mm -hmm. Danny, did you use anything um, to help you gather leaves faster or were you using your, just your own two hands? I just used my own two hands. So if you have any tips, that would probably make it go a lot faster. I think it's good to do the, your first shelter with just your hands. Makes you realize how long it takes. But you can also, like, if you have a tarp or an extra sweatshirt or something, you can stuff leaves in there and then, oh. like, drag it back to the shelter. Okay. But your hands work perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was pretty fun. Like I said, this is the first one I built, and it was, it was pretty fun to do. So definitely recommend you guys trying it yourselves. You can kind of see how Danny put one center pole in the middle and then leaned the other sticks on it. And she rested that pole in a tree that has like a, a Y in it. Um, so that, that's a good structure. I love sleeping in these. The first time I slept in one of these at a camp out, um, everyone else, it rained and everyone else's tents leaked and were cold and miserable, but I stayed dry. So I recommend it. Yeah, so here's that Y structure that Darcy was talking about. I actually just was walking for a little bit and then I saw this Y shaped tree right here just kind of grew like that naturally. And then, just my luck, this tree had fallen directly on the inside of it, so I didn't even have to move it at all. I just kind of shifted it out of the way, and here's the end of it. So this thick one runs all the way down the middle, rests in between that Y spot right over there. And then I just placed uh, leaves all the way, or not leaves, but sticks first, all the way on the side, on either side to kind of make like a little triangle structure. So any wide branch, like this one, would work perfect. Any more questions about uh, leaf hut? <laughs> Ren says the first time they slept in a fort, it was a snow fort. How do you make a, a snow fort? Great question. If I may jump in there. Sure. So there's a couple ways to make a snow fort, but one is to, especially if you have something to shovel snow with, make a huge pile of snow, kind of like the same shape as Danny's shelter, um, and then let it sit for like at least an hour, I think it is, and the snow kind of crystallizes and strengthens, and then you can just dig a tunnel out. It's called a snow cave. Um, you can just dig a, a body-shaped tunnel out of there, and then make a big snowball that you can roll to the entrance to like close your door basically. But you need a lot of snow. If there's just a dusting of snow, that can be one of the hardest environments to build a shelter in. But you can also make like um, a shelter you, by, of course you could do that like an igloo style, or you can make huge, you know, like you're making a snowman and just arrange them in the shape you want and um, cover it with a tarp or whatever you have to make your ceiling. I love snow shelters. Great question. That, that's very cool that you have slept in a snow fort. Then. Okay, well, if people have more stories to share or questions, feel free to jump in. But I will send us over to Madison now, who will talk about uh, ways of keeping us warm that don't even require shelters. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so Joe recently shared a story with me that I thought was pretty cool. It was about a group of people who, um, didn't, didn't specialize in, uh, fort building, like how Danny has showed us so far, but they, they considered their clothing as their own fort. So it was their way to shelter themselves from, from the 
element was by preparing their body and clothing that allowed them to be comfortable even without a well-structured shelter, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, they used things, Joe, Joe shared some of the animals that they used to make their clothing, and there were a lot of animals that have thick fur that live in the water. And Darcy let me know that they even used the intestines to make some of the first raincoats and probably some of the most efficient raincoats because they were very waterproof. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but today I was gonna to talk about some more modern clothing that we can wear to keep us uh, comfortable in outdoors. So on a day like today, I wouldn't really bring too many clothes with me if I was going backpacking or, or uh, hiking for the day. I would probably wear something loose, loose and um, maybe even sleeveless because staying cool is sometimes just as important as staying warm. Because if you get too hot, then you get too sweaty, and then you can get dehydrated really fast. And that can make uh, a happy, fun day a lot less fun, and it can become kind of dangerous. So wearing loose and light clothing is pretty important. And even though there's rain in the forecast today, I don't think I would bring a raincoat. So this shirt, it, it's a synthetic material, it's made out of uh, a polyester and nylon. So if it got wet from me sweating a lot or if I get rained on, it'll dry really fast. So I don't think I would bring a raincoat today. But I did pull out some clothes uh, for other types of weather that could be important. So like Danny said, um, the air pockets in a winter coat or like in her fort with the trees are what keep you warm. So they trap your body heat from from leaving and it stays next to your skin and keeps you really warm. So these are um, a pair of leggings that are actually made out of wool. And like I said, my shirt is synthetic, so it's man-made, but wool, uh, it comes from animals. It comes from sheep mostly. So this is very finely woven wool and this would be my base layer. So this is something I would wear right next to my skin. And if I got really hot, it would wick away the sweat from my body but if I was really cold, it would trap the air in too. So this would be my first layer of clothes. Then if it was really cold, I would wear these, which are fleece pants. And they're very fluffy and they're kind of baggy. So they're not very close to my skin, but they fluff out. And then if it was super cold, I would wear this shell, <laughs> which these are semi-waterproof. They've gotten a couple holes in them over the years, but this is this is, would be my outer shell and would keep me very warm. So that's all everything I would wear on my lower half. And then so my, you would wear three pairs of pants? If it was like very cold, so if it was uh, maybe a night where you'd have to sleep in a snow fort or something like that, or if I was in higher elevation, so Nowhere really in Ohio is super high, but if I was somewhere in a mountainous region like New Hampshire and I was going really high in the mountains, I would want to make sure that I have lots of clothes with me to keep me warm. And then on the top, I would wear another fleece. So this is the same material as the fleece pants. And then I would wear a down coat. So this coat is kind of cool. It can pack in its little pocket and expand into a whole coat. And you can do that with most coats, I think, most down coats. You can shove them into their own pocket. And this is a really fluffy coat, has lots of air pockets, and there's feathers inside of it that uh, make for, for a nice, fluffy, warm winter coat. And then again, I would have an outer shell that's waterproof. So that would be on a very, very cold day to keep me nice and dry and warm. And you can see that there's lots of layers, so I can adjust and I can take layers off and I can put it on. And uh, I wanted to kind of compare this layering system that we can choose to do uh, with how animal fur works. So I have a couple kinds of animal pelts here. Does anybody have a guess of what this animal pelt could be? Not quite a beaver, it's a little smaller than a beaver. That's a good guess though. 
or even if you're not sure what it is, you could name some clues that you see. Maybe rabbit, someone guess. Very Angle. close. Very close. So this animal- A wolverine? Is, oh, close, close wolverine, not quite. It's a little smaller than a wolverine. This animal Otter. is a mink, yes. Mm. So um, you can see it has tons and tons of hair follicles very close to each other. So if you're not familiar with a mink, they do live on land, but they go in water often. So they hunt for fish and eat a lots of different aquatic animals and insects. So they have nearly a waterproof coat. And the very close hair follicles are what helps it become waterproof, if that makes sense. It also, um, I know you can't feel it, but it also has lots of oils on the outside of it. And I think those oils help uh, water kind of beat off of it and roll off. And then I also wanted to show you this pelt. Any guesses here? A fox? Yeah, great. Good first guess. This is a fox. This is a red fox. <laughs> My dog is very interested in these pelts. Um, and if you can see really close, what do you notice about the different layers? Hey, get. <laughs> what do you notice about the different layers of the fur here? Can you see? It might be kind of hard, huh? Well, I could explain. So the outer part is lighter and... Um, They're different but, colors. Yes, very good. They are different colors. So the closer to the skin, the darker it gets. So it's black right next to the skin. Because black uh, holds up, like gets sun. Very good. Yep. And it might be really hard to see in this camera, but they're more curly. The hair follicles get more curly the closer to the skin. So it's, um, that allows more room for air pockets, which also keeps the fox nice and warm. Does anybody have any questions or any, anything they like to wear every time they go into the woods? Or any questions about these pelts? I always love seeing animals like the minks and the beavers because they do go in the water. Uh, and animals that go in the water because they have to stay dry have the thickest fur of any animals like otters. Otters have a million hairs in a square inch more than any other mammal because they have to stay dry. And to compare on our entire heads, we only have 100,000 hairs. That's so pretty They feel heavy and uh, a square inch would be like about that much and there yeah. would be a million hair follicles in that much space of an otter this is not an otter this is a mink but yeah that's pretty yeah. wild so it's not as waterproof as an otter but you can still feel it's kind of like a little extra heavy and smooth mm -hmm. it has lots and lots of them Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing some things for us to think about, Madison, when we are dressing to go outside. Um, and now I think I will send us over to Nate, who will show us a way to build a shelter if you have a few more tools. Let me find his video here. All right. I, uh, so I'm like Danny out at Sells Park today, but I'm on the other side of park over like the entrance across the street from Walmart by the big barn and I have created a shelter today that probably took a lot less work than Danny's but hopefully will keep me pretty safe still so I'll turn around my video so that you can see it this is what I've made today this is a tarp shelter so as you can see I've got just your regular run-of-the-mill plastic tarp and I've strung it up in between a few trees to give myself a safe little dry place to get out of the rain. So we'll come across the creek here so we can see it a little bit better. 
I've built my shelter pretty high off the ground. And that's just because I'm not trying to keep warm. It's not really raining yet. This is just maybe to keep the sun off of me, or if it does start to sprinkle a little bit, I can keep all of that rain off of me. But if I were really trying to sleep in this, I might build it a little bit closer to the ground just so I can, you know, keep things a little more under wraps. Just like Madison was, or Danny was doing with her shelter being so small, she doesn't have to heat up as much space. So here's where I started building my shelter, and this is just a little knot that's gonna hold everything down. This is where I started. So I can't cinch it down quite so much, but I can get it nice and tight so I can move on to my other knots. And over here is where the real magic happens. So this is a, some people call it a stopper knot, fisherman's knot, it's attached to my tarp. And then this right here is what's called a trucker's hitch. So this allows me to really get this nice and tight and taut uh, and pull it as tight as possible without putting a lot of strain on my rope. And why would it be so important for me to be able to tie this tight as opposed to just having the tarp loose up there? What, what would tightness have to do with anything? So this tarp is here to keep water off of me. Yeah, so rain. So if this was just nice and loose up here, there would be plenty of spaces for the water to collect, and then it would make my tarp sag, and then I wouldn't be able to really keep the rain off of me. It would just be all pulled up in one place, and I'd be fixing it all night if I was trying to sleep under here. So I keep it nice and tight so that the rain all falls along this path shoots right off on the other end and keeps keeps all that wetness off of me so what would be some other things to consider when setting up a tarp shelter can you just put it anywhere or do you think that you might have to have some other things in mind when you're setting this up I like to set up my tarp shelters right outside of Bear's Den. How about you, yeah. Nate? Um, typically, I actually try to stay away from Bear's Dens. And that's a good point, though, to think about what else is around you when you're setting up your shelter. So I've built mine right next to a stream here. So that's going to mean I can have a water source right here. I don't want to build it too close, just in case the water gets too high. Madison says trees, and that's also a really good thing to think of, not only to have trees to actually tie off onto, but we want to think about the trees that are above us, too. There's a bunch of dead trees above me. I definitely don't want to build my shelter there, just in case one of those dead trees comes down in the middle of the night. Poison ivy is another good thing to think about. But yeah, just being aware of your surroundings while you're building these shelters so that you know that you're in a good spot just like you would put a tent. Um, but you've got to think about it a little bit more because you're a little bit more exposed to the elements. This is a shelter that's great for keeping you dry and keeping the rain off of you. But it's not going to keep you as warm as Danny's debris hut. And it might not keep you as warm as a tent either. So if you were going to use a tarp shelter as your main source of shelter, you would also need maybe a sleeping bag that's going to keep you really warm for the night and also something that's going to keep you up off of the ground just like those six inches of leaves would do in Danny's shelter. So this is just for rain really more than anything. And I also you, noticed Nate that oh, yeah. you tied, sorry, that, that you tied one side higher than the other to make sure that the water rolls off of it. I did. So you want to keep it nice and tight and you also want to make sure that you've got some place for the water to go. If it's a flat sheet, then it's all going to pile up right in the middle and you're going to cause yourself some more problems. 
Joe, don't you have a way of remembering things to check for when you're looking at choosing a spot for a shelter? Yes, it's called the five W's. So basically when you're, and they just, I think covered all of them, but it makes it easier to remember. Um, there's five things to consider when picking a place to build your shelter and they all start with W. So let's see how many you can guess. Water. Yes, number one. You wanna be close enough to water that you can go and get something to drink, cook your food, make tea, but not so close that you're gonna get um, flooded. So that's one W. Wind, exactly. So if we were looking at, let's see how to explain this. So wind is the second W, but if you have um, like a shelter like Danny's, um, you don't really have to worry about it as much because you're insulated from pretty much all directions. Um, but if you have an open lean-to or a tarp shelter, you actually want the wind running parallel to your shelter. Um, a lot of people think you should have like the, the side that's, you should have the lean-to side facing the wind so you get blocked from the wind. But if you have a fire, the smoke will, or the wind will curl up over your shelter and then bring the smoke right back into you. So that's two W's, water and wind. We got three more. One clue is like, think about what Danish shelter is really made of. That starts with W. Yes, wood. So you want to build your shelter in a place that, you know, has enough wood to support what you need to do. So you don't have to go walk in miles to collect shelter materials. Okay, the next two are kind of hard, but, um, but Nate was talking about them. So um, let's see if you can get them anyway. There's two more W's. Could one, one could one be a widow's maker? What's that? A, a widow's maker? Yeah, widow maker refers to like um, a dead branch. I don't see any above me, but anytime you're building a shelter, you should always do this and see, are there any big dead branches or, you know, are there any um, big dead trees close by that could fall on you? So that's number four. And number five, Warmth, that would be a good one. Um, but number five is, is wigglies. So that's like, you wouldn't want to build your shelter on an ant mound, or if you're like in a desert, you wouldn't want to build it on a scorpion nest or near a snake den or like a bear's den, like we were talking about. So those are the five W's. I really like rocks with a W though. That's a, a good one to add. <laughs> that is the the little known six W. Um, Nate, Joe, do you have some other things to show us, or or if you have another question for Nate, go ahead. Yeah, I just have one question for Nate. Is there any place in your tarp shelter you feel like you could um, harvest rainwater, like catch it in a water bottle? Yeah, actually. So one thing that I did kind of wrong while building the shelter was that after I started setting it up I realized that my tarp was almost a little too big for the area that I have so it's actually running into a tree right here at the end of it so all the water is going to run down to this side and it's probably going to pile up against this tree and start to come down right here so hopefully I could use that to my advantage and catch the water at one of these two corners where it's actually gonna start coming out. Nice. Yeah, nice thing about, I mean, that's another nice thing about using the tarps. They're fast, you can catch water with them. You can also, before you set them up, use, you know, like pile a bunch of leaves on there and drag them back to your shelter site, which makes it go a little faster. What? Yeah, it only took me about 10 minutes to set this up. Um, and that was including finding time to find a spot as well. How much uh, rope would you recommend people carrying with them, Nate? 
Well, it depends on what and it also depends on what kind of rope you want to carry. But I brought about 50 feet of paracord with me and I cut that up into four sections, tied it to the end of my tarp and I had plenty left over. As you can see, one of my one of my strands is pretty ridiculously long over to this <laughs> sycamore tree here. So I had I had plenty left over for just setting up this shelter and that was just with 50 feet of paracord. I'm going to interrupt for a second because Danny found a Wrigley that she's going to share. Whoa. <laughs> okay, I hope you guys can see. Oh no. I got too There he goes. I was sitting like that for like five minutes while you guys were talking. <laughs> I was waiting very patiently. All right. All right. Sorry to <laughs> segue. <laughs> they do camouflage well, so something mm -hmm. to check before you build your uh, shelter, although that looked like a very harmless snake. Mm -hmm. Tiny one. All right, uh, Joe, did you want to go on? Oh, Madison asked what paracord is. Paracord is short for parachute cord. So it can also be called other things like utility line or mm, utility rope, something like that. But it's this, so like a small, tightly woven rope that's going to hold on pretty strong to whatever you're doing and also it's going to fit um, pretty nice and tight down in your pack. A lot of tarps will come these little holes in the corners of them and if you carry a big thick piece of rope that might be helpful for some situations but it's going to be tough to tie that off to your tarp. Um, there are some tricks to doing that or you can carry carabiners with you, like the little clippy things that people use for rock climbing. Um, but paracord is a pretty versatile piece of rope to bring with you. Yeah, it's a nice, strong kind of rope, and uh, it doesn't unravel like some ropes do when you cut it. So that helps. Another thing is like, you might not have a tarp with you when you're hiking in an emergency, but you might have a poncho or something else like that that you can improvise with. So be creative about your tools. All right, Joe, what's happening at the forest? Well, I advanced to yet another beaver pond because I wanted to show a couple more things that are pertinent to survival shelters. Um, and the first thing is this plant here that there's a bunch of. Does anybody know the name of it? This is what the seeds look like. Does that look familiar to anybody? Aaliyah says cattails. Aaliyah nailed it. Cattails indeed. So um, this stuff you can use to make a fire, but the seeds are also, they have good insulative properties. Like you can see how much they, f they fluff up. It's pretty amazing. So if I was out here and like caught out in some bad weather or something, even if I wasn't wearing the proper clothes, I could stuff my jeans, for instance, with this, and that would like help insulate me. But you could also use that for, um, for your shelter um, to add to the leaves or anything like that. It's really good stuff. And then the cattail leaves are also great for making bedding for your survival shelter. The leaves are like spongy, so they actually have a lot of dead air space already in there. Um, so if I was setting up a shelter somewhere close to here, I would just grab huge handfuls of this and you can tie it together in bundles so you can carry it pretty easily. Um, and I've actually had one of my best night's sleeps ever on a bed of cattail leaves. So it's good stuff. Of course, you know, around here, you gotta be careful. Cattails usually grow in wetlands. That's pretty good habitat for copperheads. So just something to be aware of. Don't forget about the wigglies. And then finally, I wanted to make a connection with our 
our uh, nest watch field trip and <clears throat> just see how these tree swallows are insulating from the weather. So in their nests, they've got dried grass and they also have feathers. Are there any eggs in there? Hard to tell. Don't think so. But yeah, I'm feeling in there, I don't feel any. But um, the feathers, you know, just like we use like down vests, um, that's what that's what they're made of is feathers. So the birds are using the same thing. And usually they like those light colored feathers from like ducks or geese, things like that. So, so that's another, it from beaver pond number two. <laughs> another cool thing about cattails, uh, I think I forget if we mentioned earlier that the muskrats might sometimes bring those as gifts to the beavers to uh, make them feel more welcoming when the muskrats want to share their lodge. But if you pull up a cattail root, it also has a kind of like a, a tasty vegetable, kind of almost like celery-ish. And a lot of the time there's this gunky gel on it, kind of like is on the inside of an aloe vera plant. So if you are a little sunburnt or anything like that, um, that can be a little bit of medicine. Yeah, you can see the pale white part that Joe pulled up the, is the tender, tasty part. But yeah, was, there are I some lookalikes, so make sure you know it's cattail don't, before you uh, go out and try this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I remembered seeing one out here, but the muskrats will just make their shelters by folding a bunch of um, cattails down into a dome. So if you ever see like a, a dome made out of cattails um, out in the woodlands, that's a muskrat shelter. And actually, these are delicious, Danny. Great question. It's like maybe uh, asparagus-like. Cucumber, yeah. It's, it's got some good refreshing flavor. But any, any food you gather from a beaver pond, you gotta wash off because they're, they're pooping in the water, of course, and their, their scat has a bacteria called Jardia in it, so you gotta be careful about that. Here's the latest dam they're working on, much shorter than the last one. So, pretty cool. Awesome. Does anyone have any more uh, shelter or survival questions or things they're curious about? Stories to share? Awesome. Well, I know the first time I spent a night in a leaf hut that I built myself, I was kind of intimidated. Um, it's definitely a hard thing to adjust to when you're used to being completely surrounded by a tent, but it really is amazingly peaceful. You can hear everything uh, and it's a really satisfying feeling. If you don't have woods behind your house or somewhere that you can reach to to try out building shelters, um, you can practice building something small, like a miniature shelter for a toy or something like that if you want to. It's good practice too. Well, before we go, is there, uh, does anyone want to share something they learned or that they think they want to try after this? Evan asked, where is the beaver dam? I'm um, like, where am I? Yes. Well, I'm at a place called the Trimble Township Community Forest, and it's, um, it's near Gloucester. It's near the city of Gloucester. It's one of my favorite spots. It's like also a land lab for the Trimble local schools. When we're allowed to do such things again, maybe we can have a a real field trip out here to check out the beaver dams. That would be awesome.
There's also some, if anyone lives near Shawnee, Ohio, if we have some local people by Lake Tecumseh, that's a good place to find beaver dams. Anyone else going to try anything or learn anything new? I'm going to try to pull all my hairs out of my head and put them into one square inch of my head. See how it looks. Well, that square inch of your head will be uh, very fashionable. <laughs> Actually, there is one quick thing I wanted to share. Unless, if other people have stuff, that let's prioritize that. Go for it. Well, I cut my hair the other day and I left the hair outside just to see if anything would take it. And today, before I left for the field trip, I saw that a yellow warbler female was picking up my hair and gathering it for her nest. So a real nice connection between human and animal shelters. Thank you everybody. And maybe we'll see you next week. And if you do build a shelter, I, we'd love to see a picture of it. Bye. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. That's very cool, Megan, about the sheep's wool in nests as well. All right.